This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Hello friends, welcome back. Welcome to the next session on data science. Today is a demo session. And we are trying to uh, understand about basics of data science, the practical understanding of data science, which tools will be used and the structure of data science in this uh, session. Let me share my screen. Generally, I use this kind of a screen for writing. Mostly, we don't use any presentations or anything like that. Our general sessions will be more like an extempore writing sessions. Today's topic would be practical data science. My name is Sitaram and I have uh, close to 16 years of experience in IT. And in the data area, I have around nine years of experience. I worked as a big data architect before. For the past four years, I'm working as a senior data scientist in one of the MNCs. Apart from 
my regular work i also conduct a lot of uh, trainings workshops conference talks and so on collaborated with career it for giving trainings on data science and these are very practical trainings so the session is kind of a introductory part of uh, how data science works in the real world and you should get a very uh, very different perspective of how we are dealing with data science from an educational standpoint i have an mtech from bits pilani and i am pursuing my phd from triple it hyderabad and i am resident of hyderabad so this is the basic information about me mostly you'll get to know more details about me in the future so without any wasting any time let me start the session imagine there is a retail company and it is doing some business a retail company can be you know if you take like us companies it could be walmart or kmart or something indian companies like dmart reliance fresh vijeta supermart like that so there are a lot of these companies which uh, which are doing regular retail business so what they do in the retail business they sell some products you know they, they the customers buy certain products so the company owners need to understand that which products are in demand when are the products sold number of quantity the quantity of products which are sold based on the time zone uh, you know you know during the week during the month during the day when are these products sold so these are all very important things for example milk will be sold in the morning and something else could be sold in the evening right so there are certain products which are sold in different time zones or different time part of the day so all this information is required because the store owners has to plan their inventory they need to maybe talk to the suppliers get the products from a different place so they need to plan for the logistics and other things so the retail owners need to uh, do some analysis on the data so first things first whenever the transaction happens the data gets stored in something called as operational data stores these are rdbms databases called as ods operational data stores these are rdbms rdbms databases typically dealing with you know storage of data sql kind of storage of data rdbms databases are not not very new ones they are very very old almost started in 1970s and so on and for decades and decades we are doing data storages in rdbms typical examples are oracle mysql postgres sql sql server these are all some of the rdbms databases which are used for storages of data now whenever uh, a transaction is happening in the retail store the data gets stored in the rdbms database saying that 1 kg sugar sold uh, 2 liters of oil sold 2 packets of milk sold so likewise these are all transactions which are getting stored in the odss and when the retail company wanted to analyze the pattern in which the data is appearing for example how many liters of milk sold in a day uh, you know how many kgs of rice sold in a month then they have to run some queries typically the queries will be sql queries and the sql queries will help them to run some analysis on the data once they are running that analysis they will get to know some kind of insights these are called as descriptive insights descriptive analysis talks about what has already happened so the transaction has already happened and they are trying to analyze what has happened so for that we run some sql queries this was the initial pattern to understand the structure of the data to understand the 
uh, how the uh, you know products were sold the the frequency of the products and all that stuff for that people were running sql queries and these queries were run initially during the business hours imagine the business hours are from 9 to 5 this is the business hour time zone from 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the evening imagine these are the business hours and the sql queries were also run during these business hours to get to know like the pattern of the data and sometimes these sql queries are long running queries which are hampering the front end transactions whenever the in input transaction is happening at the same time there is a long running sql query running which can hamper or slow slow down the tables now because of this what people told is let us not run the queries during the business hours let us run the queries off business hours now off business hours people call them as nightly jobs so this this happened long time back nightly jobs now what these nightly jobs will do they will run during the off business hours and typically if you take a us company us retail company they open the shop at nine o'clock and then close it at five o'clock. Just imagine. After five o'clock, the shop is closed so that these jobs can run during that time. Maybe at eight o'clock in the night or maybe in the uh, uh, 2 a.m. in the night when no business is happening. That's when these jobs were running. And this kind of work of nightly jobs actually, uh, you know, was 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 popular for many years till the time the dot com boom happened and uh, the geographical expansion happened so around 2000s where there was a internet boom <clears throat> there was an internet boom everybody is creating their own websites and they are no longer confined to this nine to five kind of a uh, time zone right they were they went online and they were having websites where people can book online so they were not confined to this nine to five second one was the geo expansion what does this geo expansion mean that the companies initially they were only confined to one geographic zone maybe in us so they were only in us but because the company has grown uh, big they have expanded in other geographical zones they have opened centers in australia dubai singapore europe and different places in the world so there was no such lean period which says that you know this is the time when there are no stores operating right when us is sleeping uh, the australia is awake or maybe dubai or singapore is awake there are transactions happening there and when Dubai is sleeping, maybe Europe is awake or part of US is awake. <coughs> so what is happening is because of these two important uh, changes in the in the way the business happened, these nightly jobs they were not having a specific period. We call it as a lean period. Lean period in sense the period in which we can say that okay nobody is running. Let us run our jobs at that time. So there was no such period and which caused a bigger problem so people can't run the nightly jobs as well so what they did is they've created something called as data warehousing systems that's how the initial data warehousing systems came into picture you might have heard about these data warehousing systems or you might be working in that the data warehousing systems they are the systems which decouple the front end tables to back end tables and the process is called as an etl process extract transform and load sometimes you could do a dump which is a pure extraction you can dump the front end tables to a back end tables that is a pure extraction but sometimes you can also uh, transform the data maybe you are you are dumping from two three different tables and then can you can apply some joints you can do some transformations and then dump the data to secondary warehouse tables so data warehousing came into picture and this this happened 
close to 20 years back, uh, around 2000, 2005, like that, between that time, time frame, many of the data warehousing systems came into picture where uh, people created these kind of initial jobs where the data gets dumped into secondary tables. Now, the advantage of data warehouse is first one is that we are decoupling from the front end tables so that the businesses directly work with the front end tables and any jobs which want to analyze the data can directly work with the data warehousing systems. Right? Everybody understanding this? So they, they don't have any connection with the front end tables. Now I can run the job on data warehousing systems even during the business time because this is not connected to the front end systems. There is a small period in which you dump, you know, you do the dumping, the ETL process will be quicker and you don't have to run a long running queries for analyzing your data on the front end tables. You can decouple it. That is the first advantage. Second very important advantage is the data warehousing systems can store data for a longer period of time and they can also store historical data. For example, I want to know last month's information. I want to know the information on March 2020. What happened during the first COVID? What was the impact on the business? Were the, what, what, the, the, was there a slowdown in the business due to lockdown? So if I want to know all that information, if I want to analyze that, I can still do it because data warehousing systems will have historical data. So I can analyze the old information and all that information will be available in the tables. So I can also do the comparative analysis. What is happening? Uh, what happened in March 2020, March 2021, and then what is going to happen in March 2022? So can I do a comparative analysis of, of phase one, phase two, phase three kind of uh, situations and then do a comparative analysis of uh, of my uh, sales and uh, revenue analysis. That is possible in data warehousing systems. But one thing to understand here is these data warehousing systems are primarily focused on structured data. So what do I, what do I call as structured data? They are purely table formats. They will have rows and columns First row is an integer, second row is a string, third row is a string, uh, th third row is a double. So you have some columns and then you have your data types. You'll have a pure row column format data structures. And most of the data warehouses follow this kind of a pattern. Typically, they are like an extraction of an RDBMS databases and they, they will have the row column format, pure structured information. But in the recent years, people have seen that there are a plethora of systems which are which are not just following the structured information. We also have a lot of unstructured data. Everybody following? If you have questions, please please put that in the chat window. Uh, you know, if you don't want to interrupt by opening your mic, I would like to listen from you. You can put that in the chat window. <clears throat> You guys are following, right? Can I get a yes? So far, so good. Yes. yes. Great. Yeah, you can respond in the chat window. So what we are saying here is we are understanding how the data analysis started and you know how we are looking at the SQL queries and slowly these nightly jobs came into picture. But because of the expansion, these jobs cannot run for a longer time then you know people created something called as data warehousing systems which uh, which actually uh, provided them a facility to run the jobs without impacting the front end systems they also have an ability to run historical analysis so this was very good but only one catch is that they are structured information purely structured data if i want to run some analysis on images videos or text files such kind of data you will not be able to store in data warehousing systems. So people created something called as data lakes. So they created something called as data lakes. So what are data lakes? They are 
primarily storage systems which are giving ability to store both structured and unstructured information initially they were created in hadoop systems <clears throat> recently they are using cloud based cloud cloud based systems like aws or azure etc now what are these data lakes data lakes are the systems in which you can store large volumes of structured and unstructured data now what are these structured and unstructured data you can create video data you can store videos you can store images drawing a mountain and some lake right image data you can store uh, you can store some log data logs are basically uh, structured logs you can have system logs you can have transactional logs any different types of logs you have sensor information recently with the advancements of <coughs> recently with the advancements of internet of things we have lot of sensor based information so that sensor data can be stored you can also store um, a lot of textual data right textual data for example some large volumes of text natural language processing and other things we have large volumes of text data so all these kind of data which are not structured in nature right so they are not structured in nature they can be semi structured but they are not purely structured in nature so such kind of data processing we are storing in something called as data lakes so data lakes are created in which they can store large volumes of structured unstructured data apart from apart from the one we are storing in the data warehousing systems so this is how it it worked so if you are looking at it this itself is a good amount of work if somebody wants to set up a system and ensure that it's continuously connected lot lot of storages is happening uh, continuously data is being processed some kind of transfer transformation is being done everything is happening at the right uh, right way to set up the system it is a good amount of work the work will be done by something called as data engineering team this area is called as data engineering <clears throat> we need a good amount of engineering folks who can first thing set up the systems so you you might need some uh, folks who can set up the system if you are doing an on premise setup you might have to create hadoop clusters uh, uh, you know parallel number of clusters have to be created or if you are doing on a cloud based systems you might need to have an understanding of aws cloud solutions like s3 or azure blob storage so how do you set up it and you know what should be the structure how the data will be ingested so you need to see like how the data will be ingested from the tables uh, from the flat files from the log servers um, either in a streaming fashion or in a batch fashion so you need to create those systems which can ingest the data while the data is ingesting you might have to create some intermediate systems which can uh, do some messaging uh, you know queuing process and other things for example there are kafka kinesis or a SQS queues or different kinds of queues are there which will bring in data from the front end systems to your data warehouses or or the data lake systems so you are seeing that this this requires a good amount of uh, work and uh, the the work will be done by data engineers different names are there hadoop developer <coughs> front end developer 
uh, you know, Kafka engineers or streaming engineers. Uh, there are there are people like uh, uh, you know, job roles are there like AWS uh, developers. So all of them will be responsible for setting up this system. So there is a good amount of job scope here as well, where people can get into somebody from a Unix background, somebody from a Linux background, somebody from a data storage background, DBAs, such kind of people. This is a good area to enter into the data science world. So now the data is available. It is in a very raw format. Once that is done, what people will do is we do something called as exploratory data analysis. Exploratory In exploratory data analysis, what we are trying to do is the data which is in a raw format here we are dumping images, text files and all those files. So it is in a very, very raw format. The raw format data cannot be provided to the modeling systems. We will apply some machine learning modeling, deep learning modeling, natural language process based modeling. So all these modeling systems expect the data into a clear processed format. Why? Because if the data is not processed, it will spend a lot of amount of time to figure out patterns in the data. So it will waste a lot of amount of time. The modeling time will be a lot and uh, uh, and people will end up spending more amount of money for a, for doing this uh, analysis. Sometimes analysis can also go go bad because machine learning models will try to uh, try to uh, analyze some wrong information so what we need to do is we need to clean this information so we apply a lot of techniques like encoding we apply techniques like scaling we do something called as transformation we do missing value treatment Right, so we, we do encoding, scaling, transformation, missing value treatment. Likewise, we have different, uh, likewise, we have a lot of them. I've just written a few of them, but there are some kind of processes which help to transform your data and then transformation, doing pre processing and everything. Once that is done, what we typically do is we store the features into something called as a feature store. feature store is nothing but <clears throat> is nothing but a system where you have you have kept the clean data you have kept the clean features processed features so that machine learning systems data scientists everybody can you know access the data from the feature store and you know you can you can you can process from the feature store so you can think like uh, this uh, raw data might be looking like garbage and you will clean all the garbage so that you, the, the cleaned data, the processed data will be used for your machine learning processing. In the feature store, you can have a lot of features and all those features can be pick and choose and you can apply those feature applications. Once you're done with the feature store processing, then you are applying something called as modeling techniques. Modeling is nothing but you apply algorithms. So the data will be picked up from the feature store and then you apply different algorithms. Now, I will not be able to write all the algorithms, but I will list down some of the major subsections. So you have supervised algorithms within that you have something called as classification and we have something called as regression regression based algorithms we have unsupervised uh, 
within that you have clustering you have something like pca different kinds of algorithms are there <clears throat> and then you have uh, your reinforcement learning algorithms right so different types of algorithms are there in which what they do is we try to apply these different modeling techniques and other things and they try to create the models now the models are nothing but the extraction of the information so that they extract the important information from the features they try to tap the features find out the patterns between the features and then create an a, a formula which can which can use it for future predictions now that formula or or an output can be represented as a model model is nothing but the output of your modeling algorithm which is having the information or patterns of different features used in the input for example i want to predict whether a applicant can be given loan or not so this is a bank application and then we want to predict whether the person can be given given loan or not so there are a lot of input features for example the age of the applicant the bank balance of the applicant uh, the salary of the applicant uh, uh, any existing loans uh, if there are existing loans are what is the emi of the loans uh, what is the marital status if married number of kids and other liabilities so if you are seeing there are a lot of input features which will be contributing towards the decision making of loan so if the salary is good if uh, the bank balance is good if he is able to afford uh, you know the emi comfortably then looking at all the scenarios we can approve the loan there is first process of approval or rejection of the loan which falls under classification techniques for example given all these input features can i approve the loan or reject the loan that can be done by something called as a classification technique second one if i approve the loan how much loan amount should i give should i give like 5 lakh 25000 approval amount how much should be the dispersal amount right so is it like 2 lakh 52000 eligible or 10 lakh 51000 or whatever whatever is the eligible loan amount depending upon his or her financial situation so that it falls under something called as regression techniques in regression we try to predict numerical outputs in classification we try to predict categorical outputs and then we will try to predict those outputs so given on the features what the modeling algorithms will do is they will try to create an output model which will be stored in something called as a model registry so these model registries typically will be on some cloud provider for example i i call it as an aws model registry so in aws model registry we are dumping this model and the model will be dumped as an api you create an api what will this api do it will take some input parameters and do some predictions now for dumping this we need a lot of uh, tools like flask you want to create this kind of an api so you use something like docker and other things and many times if you see many people only talk about this area people say okay machine learning data science means supervised learning unsupervised learning and they will talk about bunch of algorithms and then you will get some accuracy that's it done but if you are seeing it this is just a small portion of this entire equation right we have just seen a small portion of the equation but the actual game is how do you deploy that model how do you ensure that you know you you kind of create model registries you kind of deploy the model and uh, create some front-end inferences for example you can create a web application 
which can be created in some you know your front end team is creating in angular or maybe react just imagine you you don't know like how to create angular and react web application but your front end team has created this is your icici icici.com web application okay what it will do it will uh, it will have some fields name age and uh, bank balance and other things and then it will have a submit button <clears throat> so when you when you submit this application it will invoke this api the api will be invoked and it will give all the input features the name of the person age of the person salary of the person bank balance everything all the input features it will give it to the api call the api endpoint and the api will internally invoke the model and get the result get the predicted result and it will give a result saying that uh, based on the parameters your loan applica application is approved so then it will show in the next screen congratulations sitaram your loan application is approved and you will do another query saying that you know what is the approved amount so you'll get like your loan approved amount is 5 lakh 52000 and please follow this procedure to uh, for, for the next next further details please upload the relevant documents for uh, for the dispersal of the loan so you will get something like that and then the the customer will go and do that procedure this kind of inference is called as real time inference in the real time inference what we are doing we have created an api endpoint from the model and any front end system now that can be a web application or a mobile application directly invoking your api and then getting back the result and showing that information this type of inference is called as a real time inference similarly we can also do something called as a batch inference in the batch inference in the batch inference what we do is we we will have our model similarly we have the same model but the model instead of calling in the real time mode it will be called in a batch mode you have the same api but instead of calling in a real time mode you will call it in a batch mode by giving some input files so imagine you are giving some input file and then what it will do is it will take the input file so instead of uh, you giving one uh, one user information or one applicant information your bank clerk will create some hundred applicant informations and uh, it will it will basically provide the information to the api so what the api will do is it will run in a in, in a loop it will take every customer information every applicant information do the prediction and then create an output file what will the output file will have for every applicant you will have whether the applicant is approved or rejected if the applicant is approved what is the loan amount for which the application uh, is approved so this is called as batch inference in the batch inference what we are doing here is you will have to schedule this batch so this batch might run on some scheduled procedure so there are something like jenkins different cloud providers have their own pipelines so you're creating a ci cd based pipeline which is saying that okay every day uh, in the night 9 pm you run the job so you take uh, by the 9 pm the file will be ready you take the file uh, you know uh, do the prediction whether the person is approved or rejected if approved then get the file output after this you can you can schedule within the jenkins you can schedule another job saying that after this file is created you send an email email to all applicants 
with a generic template saying that congratulations, Sitaram, you have approved for 525,000 loan. Please uh, upload the relevant documents for, for the further dispersal of the loan. So you will email will be sent. So that is an automated procedure. So after this entire uh, prediction is done, for who are eligible for the loans, you get an email. Even if you are not eligible, you will get an email that unfortunately uh, you are not meeting the criteria of the bank. Please apply after some other time. Right? Something like that you will get. So this entire procedure is called as batch inference in, in a batch mode. One other interesting uh, area which which is important for data scientists is data visualization. Data visualization. Because data scientists need to work with a lot of data, they have to provide some graphs and charts and in, in multiple different formats. So they might need to use some tools like Tableau, or Power BI, or they will use in house tools like Seaborn or Matplotlib, etc. Right, so there are a lot of these tools which will be used, and these tools will be used for visualizing the data, trying to create some stories of the data, and representing that stories in, in a general format. Right? So that is, uh, you know, that is the crux of the today's session. So let me quickly recap what we have learned. So we were we were looking at a little history of a hypothetical situation. Like imagine there is a retail store which is storing the data in ODS tables for running some queries on it. We were running SQL queries, but the SQL queries were happening to front-end systems. So we ran nightly jobs. But, but the nightly jobs were also not getting time because of the internet and geo expansion. So people invented data warehousing systems. They were working very well for almost like 20, 25 years now. And uh, but but the problem is that they are only concentrating on the structured data. But nowadays people are also storing unstructured information. So people created data lakes, which are primarily in Hadoop or AWS or Azure based storages. So they are focusing on uh, videos, images, logs, sensor data, textual data, everything else. Now, once that is done, then we need to analyze the data. So we have to process that raw form of data. We apply a lot of techniques. Exploratory data analysis is the, is the area in which we analyze a lot of information, do a lot of pre-processing. So encoding, scaling, transformation, missing values treatment, likewise different types of techniques are there. And once everything is done, we, we extract the uh, we extract the clean features into something called as a feature store. A feature store is some something which is like a one 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 area where you are storing all your features. Then you can apply your modeling algorithms on the selected features. There are different type of algorithms. During the course, we will look at all these algorithms in in a great detail. So once this is done. You know, the once the model is created, the model will be dumped into a, a cloud-based solution, uh, either AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, or maybe an on-premise solution where you are storing your models. Those models are stored in pickle files or H5 formats. They are stored in some executable formats that typically we call as model registry. So once the model is deployed, the model can be invoked by either the front end systems or back end systems. Now, front end systems are doing real time inferences. They, they can be any web application or mobile applications. They will be calling the models, giving all the input parameters, and the model will do the prediction and give back the results. This is called as a real time inference. In the batch inference, there are scheduled jobs. They will run at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the night, weekly once they will run, or monthly once they will run. So they are scheduled jobs and they will be running by some schedulers. Jenkins are there. You can automate it using cron jobs. Different kinds of schedulers are there. So all the schedulers will be used for automating this jobs. Now this is called as batch inference in which you will you will read some input files all at once. 
and you can process all the input data and then you can create output result and once the outputs are created you can further automate it for further process probably you can send information to the drone downstream systems you might send information to all bank clerks that these are all the approved candidates for loan dispersal you can send emails to the candidates itself um, to the applicants itself saying that you know you are approved for so and so amount of loan and so on one other interesting area which is need to be understood by data scientists is about how do we do data visualizations how can you portray the stories uh, how to use tools like seaborn matplotlib tableau or power bi uh, for creating some stories and so on overall this is how the course will be structured it will be a roughly a two month course i'll give some details about the course any questions before i get into those details any questions on this are you guys following is it so we almost like spent 50 minutes non-stop are you guys following what i'm talking about um uh, yes Sitaram, it's it's very very well session um i have a question like are during the training session are we going to work on any any kind of data sets like huge data sets and create these algorithms yes okay. yes we will do that <clears throat> Okay. I'll, I'll just explain about the course structure uh, in a minute but any questions on you know this what is what any any topic here whatever we have discussed anything on that i'll give some brief on the structure of the course and all but you know any any brief on this part okay i hope you understood so let let me get into a little more fine details about the structure of the course so the course is a project oriented course first thing i prefer very well is that we need to do project oriented learning so project oriented course uh, because there are 20 plus projects which will which we will do during the course and uh, we will do two plus capstone projects which we will deploy in uh, cloud so preferably aws cloud so end to end deployment right from model model creation till the deployment and inference and other everything else we will use at least two plus projects we will create on aws cloud this is a two month duration course and um, daily course daily instance weekdays monday monday through friday so timings will be uh, 8 a.m ist so Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. IST, this is the time zone, time frame. But depending upon where you are, for example, some people can be logging in from US, different time zones, central, eastern time zones, and so on. Depending upon your time zones, you have to, you have to, you have to map that. So if you are from US, then you know from Monday to Friday will be your Sunday night till Thursday night. That is how it would be. Sunday night to Thursday night but this timings are according to the Indian time zones. So we will uh, we will cover a lot of topics. So as and when I go detail, uh, you will know about all the topics. You can get a uh, course curriculum from the organizers. They will be sending you the course curriculum which will have list of topics, what projects we'll be covering, uh, what data sets we will be using and other things. Uh, for this project, I would expect uh, to have a little bit of understanding of any programming language, preferably Python. We will be using Python. I will be also covering Python for data science as, as a topic, as a module, which will cover about all the Python related uh, uh, tools and techniques which are used for data science. But I might not go in a very, very 
detail about what is a, a string, what is a variable, how do we define variable in Python. So those things I might not be able to cover. So for that, uh, it doesn't matter any programming language, but you should have one programming language. It could be C, C++, Java or .NET or any general purpose programming language. Understanding of basics is, is something which is required. And I hope, uh, I hope whoever is attending has that basics. If not, you can also contact uh, the organizers. They are having some introductory level courses which which can help you to get some brush up of some knowledge on that area especially if you want to take you can also take python python could be a basic uh, you know introductory one which will help you to understand uh, the basics of python right and um, <clears throat> so anything let me let me think about it so these are the prerequisites. So you, we require at, at least a little bit of Python and so on. And rest assured, we will be covering a lot of topics on math. We will be covering on statistics. We will be covering on Python for data science. We will be uh, doing on uh, uh, machine learning, natural language processing, deep learning, cloud computing and DevOps. So these are all very comprehensive course. So we will be covering all these topics in, in a great detail. And, um, and during the course, we will be concentrating on the project oriented thing only. We will have very less presentations, maybe one or two in the entire course, I just will have one or two presentations here and there, but most of the course structure would be in this manner where we will have extempore, depending upon the queries you have, I will be, you know, going through the course structure and I would encourage people to have a lot of questions, do preparation and, uh, you know, so that you can get into better uh, role progressions, better job opportunities and so on. And believe me guys now you now it's a very very nice phase of uh, switching people are getting huge salary hikes and you know there is a lot of demand in the job market right now so if you are somebody who would like to uh, you know make that switch you want to prepare and make that switch so this is the time so maybe after uh, maybe after few months or maybe after a year you might not have this kind of a boom again because people will uh, settle down, companies will settle down with all the new entrants. So they will try to extract, you know, uh, extract work from the new entrants. But uh, if anybody would like to do some switch or change in the career, this is the time where you would like to do that switch. Uh, one other important thing which I would every time focus is a T kind of a structure. So in data science, you have to focus on the depth and the breadth. In the depth, we have to cover the data science part, algorithms, machine learning, deep learning, NLP. These are all things which we need to cover in the depth, which we will focus in the course. But apart from the depth, you need to cover about the breadth also. The breadth covers about cloud and DevOps. So you need to understand about at least one cloud provider, preferably AWS or Azure. So again, I'm not saying that you need to have complete understanding of cloud. Cloud itself is a good big course. But you need to know like if I want to deploy my models into cloud, what are the things which need to be understood so that whenever you get into the job, you're not just understanding about one specific algorithm. You need to know the full uh, gamut of um, gamut of work like, you know, how you connect to different systems, what different DevOps tools you use, how do you how do you use Docker or how do you create containers? Uh, how do you? Uh, you know automate your systems using Jenkins and so on so all these things are very important 
so in our course we would be covering those things so not only the depth but we will also cover the breadth which is required for getting a very good job all right any questions now is this course will cover algorithms yes we will cover all the possible algorithms at least like we will cover 20 algorithms in the in the course in the entire course any other question um is there like ml ops or something i am hearing like is it same as like devops or yes so i i gave the name as devops but here i can replace it with ml ops but yeah that is the exact thing we need to learn so for example like how do we deploy the models as i was saying right so here this area this area is called as ml ops this entire area now understanding of dockers class based containers deploying into registries creating systems which can detect the drift in the data because see i deploy the model but my work will not complete at that time i need to you know oversee the model in couple of months uh, check like if if the model is giving same accuracy or is there any drift in the accuracy so today i deploy the model it is giving 92% accuracy in predicting loan applications but after few few months uh, you know you know some features changed and some data changed and my accuracy dropped down to 81% so again do i need to retrain my model how do i create an automated system which can uh, automatically detect the drift and based on that uh, retrain the model so all these things are very important so those those all things are covered here which will be part of MLOps. Okay. And we are covering them, right? So you will be covering that all yes, the yes. Okay. exactly. We will be covering them. That's the reason I, I talked about this T structure in which DevOps here, here I can call it as MLOps. And uh, Azure Cloud or AWS, how much knowledge do we need for this course? Like, it's just a basic understanding, or like, do we have to do? No, even if you don't have any knowledge, that is fine. But I will be talking about from an MLDS perspective, how do we deal with those uh, cloud providers, right? Now, how do I launch virtual machines? How do I launch containers on one of the cloud? right those things i will be talking so that should give a base idea about any of the cloud even if you don't have any understanding by the time we reach there you will clearly understand why i am doing that okay thank you any other questions So people also will have a question like you know what is the ideal time frame to to do a switch to get a job right so what i would say is ideally uh, give at least three months for very very aspirant person to six months for somebody like me okay so uh, ideal time frame will be from three months to six months this is a very ideal time frame in which you can do a very positive switch so if you have started from very basics so you can give a three month time frame and in which you know we are doing a two month course and uh, you could take a one month for preparation right and uh, you know after that you could do the search and i've seen very positive results in this kind of a time frame so in between three to six months you should be able to uh, plan very very optimistically so for example you're starting right now start of february 
February, March, April. So end of April, you should be very comfortable uh, in getting into some of the job interviews and cracking them. So you need to uh, positively prepare a lot of things. You need to have a very good uh, social presence. Uh, uh, you need to have a very good LinkedIn presence or maybe uh, you need to have good presence in Naukari or Indeed. Create your profiles, you will get calls, you have to attend interviews, you have to practice them. And during our course, I would also give you tips and tricks about resume preparation, resume prep or interview prep. And people come to me for one on one mentoring like you know, there could be a, you know, you might be already working for 10, 12 years in in industry. You have done so and so and so things uh, you might require one on one mentoring like, you know, how do I switch my gears like I'm doing, uh, you know, QA right now for many years. Uh, how do I get into one of the data science areas, which is the right area to get in? or maybe I am a mainframe developer, then after that I've switched my uh, career into program management and for, for many years I'm now a program manager or a delivery manager. Now how do I get into uh, back into a techno managerial kind of roles or a lead roles in data science area, which are the best areas to focus? See, these are all are very specific to candidates, right? So it's one-on-one -on -one session. So uh, when you are ready, you know, people people come to me like, you know, what next? And then I would give one on one mentoring sessions uh, for for them to prepare for the next uh, uh, set of a, uh, these things. During the course, I would encourage to have one plus one. Our preparation. What one plus one means one hour of our course time and one hour during the day anytime right so so totally i have people have to give uh, around 10 hours per week this is a very very uh, fruitful number so if you give like 10 hours per week which is like one hour our course every every day uh, for five days you'll have one hour of our, our course and five more hours you have to spend throughout the week anytime maybe today you sit in the evening for two hours and then do some practice i will be giving assignments i'll be giving uh, some course materials uh, all those things you have to practice so you practice that and roughly if you give around 10 hours of your time every week um, rest assured that you, you you should you should get a very very fruitful results by the end of three months right this is a general uh, general uh, you know number you know that could change from person to person some people can you know get up and running within two months itself uh, some people might take four months five months so depends right so how much effort and you're putting what is your learning curve and other things so based on that this is a much more idealistic time time frame all right so this should give you a very very clear understanding and uh, I would recommend to come to the course, uh, even if you uh, not not decided yet, but just listen to a couple of sessions. Uh, you should get more clarity on the way of delivery or the content we are covering and other things. I would also take one session to cover on the entire course content of the course so that I will clearly explain what are the things we will be covering during the course. Uh, the next few days we will be doing some basic introductory material on applications of data science and different other things my introduction to machine learning the content for the course and different other things we will be covering in the next few days so you can attend that you will get a basic understanding of what we will be doing during the course and later you could decide so please get in touch with the course organizers if you have any other questions you can get in touch with the course organizers they have given the required numbers on the emails so you can send an email or get in touch with the course organizers they will be able to help you with any of your doubts all right
So any other questions if you have we can we can spend a few minutes or else uh, we can drop off I'm done with my session uh, you were mentioning um, why this is the only right time to switch you are saying like after one year no the reason I'm saying is currently the market is very hot right there's a lot of switch happening there's a lot of gap not sure you know may I ask you uh, are you uh, in US or in India or any other place I'm in US so US the reason I'm talking about US market is currently because of 2020 2021 there was a huge crunch in H1 uh, you know uh, people so not many people traveled with H1s in 2020 uh, so there is a huge shortage in the market and there is a huge demand in the number of jobs not only data science but also in other domains as well and data science is even hotter so the reason I'm saying that it is hot now is because uh, the market is hot uh, many people giving good amount of packages good amount of shift is happening there's a lot of requirement available so that's the reason um, this this is a, I'm not saying ideal but this is a suitable time for doing your switch okay. maybe after okay. a year if things settle down right uh, if everything comes to normalcy and you know there are not many job roles or job crunch then uh, you you might get into normalcy so so that's the reason i'm saying <clears throat> even okay. the competition is very less now so you can enter easily uh, pardon what was that Could even the comp it? competition is very less now so it is better to enter yes. now uh, than later if you are in us this is yes. the prime reason h1 crisis is huge and uh, is not many people out there uh, this year there's a lot of lotteries have been approved many people are traveling not yet traveled the stamping crisis is there people have not traveled yet are very difficult to travel dropbox appointments are going till june uh, april june so the market is suitable now that's the, that's what i'm coming to point okay so but uh, uh, my question is like how this field will be in the long term the field is going to stay for a long term the reason is because uh, data and data analysis uh, is there for many years so this this history whatever i've given right so this is there for many years only that the the way it is being done is being changed maybe now people have embedded more unstructured information so it's it's kind of starting for a couple of years they it has started so in the future at least from five to ten years down the line things would change but what i encourage people is having a very strong command on one of the cloud provider the devops tools and the depth if this competency is there next five to ten years we are we don't have any problem if you're only concentrating on one of these things maybe uh, one of the algorithm or tool or something like that then you know that could change the algorithm today it is xyz tomorrow it can be abc or some x some something else but you know if you are concentrating on the entire tool tool set then you know it is going to stay for at least for five to ten years now right so that's that's what my thought process is okay thank you great any other questions okay thank you very much and have a nice uh, weekend uh, i'll talk to you on monday and uh, we can discuss much more things in the data science uh, till then have a nice day, stay safe. Take care. Bye bye. Thank Hi, you. thanks for joining. Uh, this is Vijay from Kerigati. Uh, and small info from our end. Uh, new batch will be starting from Monday. It will be 31st Jan. Timings, uh, as Sitaram told, uh, it would be 8 a.m. IST. 
okay for any query uh, you can contact us we have shared a uh, contact numbers and mail id in chat thank you everyone thank you vijay garu thank you guys we'll talk to you later bye bye thank you bye bye